So um, what I'm going to start now, as I told you before, is uh, the topic of the fracture mechanics. And the fracture mechanics is um, a topic which is usually um, lectured uh, at the TUM um, from Frau Christine Radelbeck. And um, she was a uh, yeah, PhD student at the TUM from 1919 to 2005. And um, now um, is also again back at um, our chair and now gives here the fracture mechanics lecture. And uh, thanks to her, I also could took her slides um, to go here to the UCR. And So, and um, therefore, um, as yesterday, um, I already used uh, the, the word brittle fracture. And the brittle fracture is always something which has a smooth uh, surface. And therefore, um, some in, the future, uh, in the past, there has been some accidents. And these accidents are, um, until now, well known. For example, as the accidents of the sh Liberty ships, um, there have been um, 270,000 damages and 500 serious and 90 total failure. So, and uh, total failure of 20. So, and how does it look like? Um, so, the ships are just broke in the middle. And um, so, what was the accident there? was uh, that the material couldn't handle the stress amount and also the, uh, the cold stresses there. And so at the end, uh, during um, action, they just broke in twice. And at the end, uh, yeah, there was a, uh, a famous guy who at the end uh, bought the ships and um, could earn a lot of money because he did know about this effect and at the end, could handle it and uh, just was shipping in a warm area, uh, so in the South Mediterranean Sea. So, um, some other causes welds which were produced by a semi skilled workforce contained crack like flaws. Um, so, this is always uh, the same assumption. So, we have some, some welded parts. And this well part always with some failure on the surface. And uh, so the uh, small cracks are always there. Um, in this case, you don't say, okay, they're, they're cracks, they're always flaws. And um, so most of the fractures initiated on the deck at the square head corners where there was a local stress concentration. And also the steel material the Liberty ships were made of from had poor toughness and um, this was measured later by this Sharpie impact test. So as you can see here, uh, the noun toughness is now um, something we are talking about, uh, I would say the next 30 minutes. So this is uh, always the material um, property which at the end uh, gives the resistance to the failing material. So, and how is it investigated in material testing is uh, due to the Sharpie impact tests and the Sharpie impact tests um, were made of course by Mr. Sharpie and I'm going to show something later. So, uh, some other accident is the airplane comet, um, which uh, crashes in 1954. And also there, stress singularity appeared uh, very, very close to that of a crack. And so afterwards, two cracks, uh, two crashes happened. And so what was at the end, the outcoming was that, for example, before, as you can see here, uh, the windows are quite rectangular. So um, we have here, um, due to the, the shape of the window, a high stress concentration. 
And at the end, a solution is to give um, the shape of the window a more um, yeah, curvy design. And so at the end, um, they could handle um, these disasters and also the scratches. And so this was the investigation which at the end um, yeah, could, uh, could give there a better improvement. So in the case of civil engineering, um, there was the Point Pleasant uh, Bridge in the USA, which failed in 1976. Uh, as you can see also here uh, during December. So also there we had a material defect, uh, some corrosion, and uh, there the crack grows until the failure, uh, because also in this case um, of the fatigue loading, but also um, due to um, the defects and the corrosion which appeared. And uh, so at the end, as you can see here, um, the bridge just broke down. And what was the resulting new rules and standards for inspection and quality control were set up. And this was also somehow, um, as, as we think, um, the, yeah, since then the fracture mechanics is applied in civil engineering. So some other, which is um, for the German students more well known, is the accident uh, in the 1998. Um, so there has been uh, crashes of the ICE. So this is um, the, the high-speed train in Germany. And uh, what happened there? Um, so we also have uh, here some material defect uh, in the wheel. And due to um, the combination of some rubber and uh, a really thick steel wheel of around 60 millimeters, um, the crack appeared inside, it could not uh, be detected um, or was not detected um, by NDT uh, tests and so at the end um, the, the wheel failed at the, at the high speed and uh, the train at the end crashes into the bridge. As you can see here, 100 uh, deaths people and uh, 80 people were injured. So this is brittle fracture, is a type of catastrophic failure that usually occurs uh, without prior plastic deformation at an extremely high speed. So the high speed, uh, of course, is not related to the high speed of the ICE. It is related to the occurrence of the cracking. So it is a really fast cracking behavior. Um, so that at the end um, it is like you have a stable structure and you have some changing in the load and at the end uh, in one second the whole section brittles or fails into two parts and this is uh, what we here mean with extremely high speed. Then also the brittle fracture uh, is not as common as fatigue. So this is also the issue why it is uh, characterized by progressive crack development and also yielding or buckling failures. But um, in this case, if this appears um, always human life is highly property demanded. So what are also um, some other cases is um, that, of course, in this case, also the notches uh, are highly demand um, to have there a stress phase and also um, under these certain conditions to have a suspicion fracture or brittle fracture. So, um, how do we go? Um, so. What is the estimation now is that with the fracture mechanics, it can be estimated how long a structure may be used after crack has been detected. Um, to this purpose, critical crack length based on respective crack propagation is calculated and the main objective is to avoid brittle fracture. So what does it mean? So we have For example, again, our plate uh, with the hole. And at the end, 
we have here our correct length a and due to the fracture mechanics we want to calculate at the end our delta a but also the ac So, and this is the issue uh, why, um, yeah, this, uh, this point is now somehow also in, in established for uh, the maintenance and also the, yeah, um, the inspection of historic or old structures. Um, so that at the end we can give an assessment um, to the critical length, but also to uh, the occasion why the, the which part gonna fail and also why it can happen and which influencing factors are there of course is the material then also the design the production so this is also some parts we already had for uh, the fatigue life and also the loading history and also at the end of course the maintenance and in this case the inspection why is the inspection so important? Is um, because if we have some inspection intervals, we also can see, okay, how fast is the crack grow, uh, growing? Um, is are our in, uh, estimations and calculations all right? And so we can say, okay, um, also when is there importance to go there? to see is there uh, some necessity to uh, rebuild the structure or just to fix the small part in the structure and uh, maybe just to, to cut off the joint, build, rebuild the joint or add some, uh, some plate or some other structures. So uh, in this case, um, we also have the triangular of, of course, the crack size. So this is the size we have here. Then the applied stresses, so the loading itself, and at the end the fracture toughness, which defines at the end the AC, um, and, and so the fracture toughness at the end is always in uh, in related to the applied stress and also the correct size. So how does it look like? Um, so at the first, um, we always have to define a crack uh, in our structure. So for example, for welded parts, we say, okay, cracks are always there. If we go for a base material, uh, maybe in the inspection, we see, okay, there is a crack, and this is our starting crack. And um, due to um, the, the resistance curve you're gonna apply, you can assume a crack growth rate, and therefore, at the end, um, give some advice due to the critical lengths to say, okay, what would be a damage tolerant design? So um, there is a, a critical length where your structure gonna fail and uh, beyond you're still in a damage tolerant design. So, and of course uh, we want usually, this is uh, the curve you're gonna assume and uh, at the end, hopefully this is the crack growth of your real structure so that at the end um, your you're on the safe side and um, your approach does fulfill the lifetime and also the next ins inspection interval so that at the end you can say, okay, um, your estimation are good, your material law which you applied satisfies your approach and also um, the, the loading is not as irregular as it may occur in some other stages. So. Uh, therefore, um, as we already talked about, the fatigue is the loading capacity, loading capacity of the material and um, in this stage the static capacity is loaded 
lowered due to the dynamic loading. Assumptions, um, in this case for the fatigue always, the structure is free of cracks. So as we uh, had yesterday, um, usually we have a long time of an initiation of the crack and afterwards the crack um, started and um, the crack growth is at the end the smallest part of our fatigue design. So consequence um, for the fatigue crack development in places uh, which causes of course uh, due to local stress concentration. So that's why uh, we talked also in the morning about the stress concentration, what is uh, the idea of a notch, what is a notch, and why is it so important to, to focus um, on notches in the structure and how they're gonna be designed. So the fraction mechanics now, um, basic assumption, cracks are existing, so we always have cracks and we cannot calculate without any crack. But important is always how big is our crack. So therefore, uh, now we go into the basics and also into the, the linear elastic fracture mechanic. So the linear elastic fracture mechanic is always, uh, as it already said, just for linear elastic material behavior. If, for example, you have um, some, some plastic or linear elastic plastic uh, behavior, um, you have to define some modifications, and these modifications um, are always done due to the resistance curve or due to the applied um, stresses. So, and um, at the end, I hopefully uh, complete this capital uh, or this chapter by uh, point five, which is the FID diagram, which is at the end um, some some diagram which shows, okay, can, can your structure fail due to the crack size or can it maybe handle at the end also this crack which you assume or which could be inside your structure. So, um, let's start again. Basic uh, specimen. How does it look like in our uh, tension test? So we have here our specimen, the specimen itself uh, in the tension test. We apply some force, we have some elongation and due to this we have here at this part um, the reduction of our cross section and hopefully our material is really ductile so at the end we have a large deformation. So this is what we usually calculate in our structure or what we assume in our structure. Uh, <coughs> but also due to yeah, temperature or some other, uh, some other uh, behavior uh, in the material, we also can have here some brittle failure and or brittle material, uh, which at the end results also to some brittle failure, but also uh, has, of course, just some small elongation. So this is uh, something also we see here. Uh, in the shape of our crack. So at the end, um, in the tension test, um, you can you already see, okay, how ductile is your material, how brittle is your material. So um, how does it look like uh, if we now go for the fracture mechanics? So this is, for example, um, a specimen which is usually tested there. So just um, the specimen, it is also on a slide later. Um, just looks like this. Of course, it is 3D. And um, so we have there a small material specimen, and inside the material specimen, we already have here some applied crack or some applied notch. And at the end, um, we have at the loading, uh, just for brittle fracture, just only little deformations, of course, and um, the surface is quite cleavage. And um, so for what happened, of course, non-metals like glass, ceramic, uh, we have this problem always there. 
and in kind of material, of metal materials, of course, for low temperatures. And um, the ductile uh, fracture um, is for loading over uh, the yield strength, so we have the plastic deformations and also some fracture surface, which is stringy. Uh, and so, new uh, where does it occur? For new metals and for normal and high temperatures. So, uh, this is something we usually want to apply on our materials. If we design a material or if the, if the companies design a material, of course, they, they want to have high yield strength, high uh, ultimate strength, but also at the end, they have to look um, on, on the ductility, but also on the fracture toughness. So, um, these pictures we already had yesterday. Um, so, how does it look like? Brittle fracture, ductile fracture. You can see the differences just in the shape of the, sur of this, of the surface. And um, more in the microscope, uh, the ductile fracture also more stingy. So, um, again, um, what we had yesterday, um, how does it uh, go in the separation of our crystalline structure? So, also there, uh, we have to talk about the transcrystalline trans failure, uh, which is just going through the crystallines and breaks up the crystallines. So uh, also the atom atomic structure inside our crystallines, uh, but also the intercrystalline structure, which is just going on the edges of the crystallines and so destroys the binding between the two. So so. And um, the, at the end, um, this is the main assumptions uh, which we're going to go at the, the next step is that the failure of the structure, this crack is dependent on the fracture toughness of the material. So in the material and science, science and also metallurgy, the toughness is ability of a material to absorb the energy and deform plastically without fracturing. So, this is the reason uh, why we have to talk about the fracture toughness, because at the end, the fracture toughness gives us an idea uh, on how much energy can our uh, material absorb during the, the rupture, during the, the fracture situation. And, um, but also at the same time, we want to have some deformation and uh, also cure without uh, fracturing. So this is uh, in this regarding uh, what I said before. For example, if you go more, um, if, or if we have just brittle fracture, we have no, we have no plastic deformation. Uh, and the small uh, energy which the system or the material can absorb. But if you go for a more ductile material, we have uh, deforma plastic deformations and also um, the energy which can be absorbed is much more higher. So, um, at the end, uh, how do we get the information of our energy uh, approach? Uh, the energy is always uh, the release rate, the energy, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the energy release rate uh, for the driving force for fracture. So this means um, we have a force which we apply on our structure, which we apply, for example, also on our crack here. And at the end, uh, this all can be combined together in some energy approach. And due to this, of course, we have here some elongation and uh, some deformation and the force times the rectangular way of the, um, or the way times the rectangular force, uh, a parallel force gives us the energy. And um, so at this time, uh, we have for G is GZ is the moment of our fracture. So. And, of course, the GC 
is the critical energy release rate, and this is a measure for our fracture toughness and has to be described for or as the material resistance. So, in this case, um, we have, of course, different definitions also for our fracture toughness. Um, and so, at the most time, um, we talk here for static loading um, or for quasi static, lo quasi -static loading. Uh, about materials notch toughness, which is investigated with the Charpy test. So, how does it look like our Charpy test? Uh, looks quite easy. So, we have here our specimens, and at the same time, um, the specimen is here. Then we have here a hammer. This hammer falls down, breaks our specimen, and at the end, ended up at a specific height. And um, so the loss of, uh, of energy, which result, of course, in the height here, is uh, the absorbed fracture energy. So how does it look like? Uh, this is a, um, a choppy test stand in real. And um, so how does it look like? So we have here the weight, the G is the weight of the impact hammer. Uh, the H1 is the height of our impact hammer and the H2 uh, at the starting position and the H2 is the height of the impact hammer at the turn of point, uh, point of return. So uh, the Charpy hammer falls down, goes here, and then of course at the end goes back. And so the H2 is the point of return. And um, also the D D decay, um, and the V are our specifications of the cross sections in our specimen. So at the end, we can define um, our AK, which is um, the notch toughness um, over G times H1 minus H2 divided by the cross section. So, um, how does it look like our? different uh, testing situations um, are here for a V-notch and a U-notch. So the V-notch um, has here, this is somehow depending on the height uh, which you at the end choose regarding to the material and the specification um, of your specimen. And so at the end um, you can find uh, a diagram which is resulting on the one side on the temperature and also on the next side uh, on the plasticity, so on the, frac on the notch toughness performance of our material. And as you can see here, um, you also have already some, some material behavior, but also some, uh, I would say, some behavior of your cross section included. So, for example, for really low temperatures, uh, so we, we are here around minus 200, but this is something which is um, also uh, depending on, on the material itself, so on, on how it is treated and on how it is produced. Um, it can really change. And so at the end, you have here information, for example, for uh, the high impact loading, uh, about the plasticity, but also for the low temperature, uh, for the plane strain behavior, so for really brittle behavior um, for this small section. So, and uh, more compared uh, to the frac uh, fracture behavior, but also the, the fracture uh, occurrence in, in our details. So we have here, as you can see, um, quite undeformed uh, shape of our specimen. So that's why we say, okay, there is, is a plane strain uh, behavior and um, we have low notch impact energy. So we can also handle just low forces in, in our system or in, in our cracks. And from this part, uh, from around here, O degree, uh, we have a transition zone which uh, goes to a behavior which is also 
some kind of brittle, but also ductile. And at the end, uh, we have the ductile behavior um, at around yeah, 60, 70 degrees. And usually in our designs in civil engineering, uh, we are somewhere here. So this is why uh, this is still important. And uh, we have to, to look on um, for our materials, but also if we have some designs, um, how this is going to act on our cracks. And so at the end, can define for a, uh, for a static load also the, the failure situation for defined loading. So, um, how does it look like, for example, uh, for different steels? So, the, um, at the end, we want to have in our material design, so this is a part which is usually done by, uh, by the companies who produce the materials. Um, so, they want to have some, some top level for the plasticity level uh, and also some plane strain for the lowering uh, area. And at the end, uh, due to the material design for steel one, steel, uh, steel three, steel two, steel one, you just uh, shift this area in the rectangular, uh, horizontal, sorry. And how does it look like? For example, if you go uh, in our material, usually uh, you say, okay, you design for an uh, S355 or uh, um, S235, and um, but you also have some situation, uh, some tempered situation, um, how your material is treated. So, for example, for hardened material, you have a high plasticity zone, and at the end, also some really low energy uh, for brittle fracture. And uh, if you, for example, go from the hardened to the unyield uh, situation in your material, uh, you see that, for example, the brittle situation is always there. And uh, the ductile behavior is more reduced, but also uh, if you go for your material, um, for example, um, you have lower um, for the unyield, you have an uh, increasing of your yielding, and um, but, and the ultimate strength is also somehow increased, but not as much. So at the same point, um, your material is not as ductile. So, and this is also something you're also going to see here already. So, and usually um, in our case, uh, for I would say for the environment uh, we have in, in Europe, uh, we define it for this um, the material to a definition of T27 Joule. So this is something which is um, like a, a quality reference uh, for the uh, Chopp impact test. And this is something which has to be defined also in due to the materials we use. And at the end, uh, results in also, um, for example, that you, that you are not allowed to use uh, some specific materials for bridges. Uh, because they are applied, uh, they are applied in some cold situations. But for example, for uh, some framework inside a building, um, of course you can go and um, have other materials because uh, you don't have these cold situations. So I don't know uh, for Costa Rica uh, if there are, for example, in the high uh, level areas, if there is also some some cold situation. This. I don't know how much is cold is, what is the coldest uh, temperature you're going to have? About 10, maybe? Yeah. 10, yeah. So you see you're already there. So for example, usually we have to go until minus 30, minus 40, but at the end uh, this is not as much. So, and, but this is also why we have, for example, in our material design, uh, this established. So, um, for example, uh, to get a little bit out of the box of uh, designing with the steel, uh, we also have here a small chapter to aluminium. 
And um, due to this, I just want to explain some specific behavior in the uh, in case of aluminum alloys. So, for example, uh, usually uh, we define for our aluminum alloys uh, or also in steel structures, you go and say, okay, you have a base material and the base material have, in this case, just the FPO2. So this is the proportion uh, strength to, uh, which is comparable to the yield strength in steel. And also you define an ultimate strength. But due to the heat, heat treatment in in the valid part, um, you have here, which is called the heat affected zone. And in this zone, you always have, due to the applied uh, or induced uh, heat, um, yeah, energy due to the welding, uh, some lowering of um, your strength. Is. So for example, um, for material, as the 58.3, um, you can have a tempered situation of 0.11, where in this case you say, okay, you have here a factor which is called the rho huts. So the rho huts is at the end some scaling factor due to the base material. And for example, for a tempered situation of OH111, you have a rho huts of 0, 0.0. But for example, for O13, you have a decreasing, decreasing of uh, five percentage, uh, which can be also for other materials. Um, go down until uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. So this is something which is a little bit specific if you go for aluminum alloys, that if you use uh, some welded joints, um, you also have to be, have to be care on um, what is lowering uh, in the material strength due to your treatment. So why is it important? Uh, because here uh, we also have the information about the heat affected zone and the filler. And as you can see here, uh, at the end, um, the filler, of course, it is uh, the most, um, yes, the most important part in the well part. So this is also the part which has at the end the highest strength. So we also have here the, the, mo the highest notch uh, toughness. Then we have here the information about the base material, but at the end, um, our heat affected zone has the lowest um, information or the lowest notch toughness um, due to our Torpy test. So, and this always, um, for example, results due to the treating situations in uh, aluminum alloys, but also um, due to uh, the aluminum, yeah, uh, the, the welding itself. So at this part, it can change um, due to the amount of uh, weld sims you apply there. It can change due to um, the, the energy you bring into your system. And so this is always the raw HAC set is always just an, a, an engineering approach to have a number to calculate there. So. How does it look like? Um, as we had before, um, the fracture toughness for the aluminum alloys did look like a little bit different uh, to the steel before. So why is it like this? Um, because if we look, like, uh, if we look on our material um, we have for steel, we have a KRC crystal uh, and for the aluminum alloys it is a KFC crystal. So there is another uh, ordering of the atoms and then on the combination of the atoms. And this results also in, as you can see here, in the fracture toughness, but also in the 
uh, in the tension curve. So, for example, if you compare uh, your tension curve for aluminium, it looks like this. For steel, it looks like this. So, and this is uh, something which is just uh, regarding to the structure of your crystals. So, and of course, uh, don't forget um, the real brittle uh, part here, uh, the glass, the ceramic, and also the high strength steels. So, what is at the end uh, our toughness true sigma epsilon curve? So, um, as you, for example, as you see here, um, we already have here some tension tests. So the tension test at the end is also giving you some information about um, about the, the ductility, but also about the energy which is can handle be handled by your, your material. So in in the job impact test, of course, um, you have an, not a controlled uh, or it is controlled, but not re not not as controlled uh, as in um, as in the tension test. So due to this, um, of course, you cannot just say, okay, you uh, you go there, take the tension test, and uh, you just recalculate the energy which is inside your structure. But uh, it also gives you some good ideas uh, why you have some differences in in the top impact test and why you should do it due to different temperatures. So, for example, um, this, I don't know, is the definition of a true sigma epsilon curve, is it uh, known? No, okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, so, for example, if you go for If you go for a tension test, you have here the tension test, and um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so in the tension test, you say, okay, you have an engineering stress, which is F over A. So, and your epsilon engineering uh, is compared to delta L over L zero. Uh, and your sigma true at the end takes into account your sigma engineering times one plus epsilon, uh, I forgot log. So, and what is, what is included here is just uh, the reduction of uh, your cross section. So you have a starting cross section of B0 and A0. And at the end, um, at this situation, you just have a constant uh, volume. And due to the constant volume, your cross section is reduced due to the elongation in the material. And so at this point, uh, your curve goes up and has an increasement in the true stresses in the material. So if you just account your true stresses and the true strain, you have at this situation some different stress state as you usually would assume in your assumptions. So for example, in, in a beam cross section, you always would calculate with the engineering strains. If you go for plasticity in in a volume model, you have to take into account your, uh, your true stress and true strains um, because the volume element um, shows the behavior of the continua, and so it also has some reduct or it is uh, it has the, the information of the deformation, and therefore you have to define the, the right material behavior. So, and uh, so I lost the point. Um, yeah, okay, so, and at the end, um, oh, I lost the point. Um, so, 
Sorry? Yeah, um, but I lose the point, uh, my goal of the, the slide <laughs> uh, by switching to this. Um, I have to mark and come back later on the slide. Otherwise, so, so now V times A times B. Ah, yeah. So I got it. Uh, <laughs> so, so at this point, as you can see here, uh, we have two materials, A and B. So, and at the end, the the deformation energy, which is inside your system is defined by the strain and also by the stress of the material. So at the end, you can also go there and say, OK, uh, can you see, which is something just done here for the continuer in the tension test, uh, is something, the integral about um, from L0 to L fracture of FDL over AL. And of course, uh, you have to to go there and use here the real behavior of the material to have at the end um, in the integration the whole area beyond uh, your strain stress curve. So this is that's why we, we talk here about the true sigma epsilon curve. Um, but as you can see here, for example, if you have a material A and B, uh, usually you would say, okay. Um, Okay, of course, you have higher yield strength, you have higher ultimate strength, A is much more uh, better on the one side, but um, due to the integration procedure of the area, uh, at the end, um, you have not also the importance of the ductility in the material, um, because the ductility at the end uh, gives you or defines you also uh, the area beyond this section or beyond this stress strain curve. So that's why um, you have here at this point, for example, for brittle, fract of brittle material, uh, low toughness, and for ductile material, you have more, high duct uh, more higher toughness. So this was the goal. So, and so how does it look like? Of course, uh, true stress engineering strain, so uh, the same as we have here. So just by reducing the, the gross section and applying uh, the information of the gross section, you have at this point a recalculation of the stresses, but also of the strain. So also in this case, the strain is, uh, is redefined and um, you have to, to get this into account. So at the end, um, why do we uh, use or apply the job in particular? It's just to uh, have a quality control on the one side, but also, um, for example, for the investigation of aging processors. So as I said, for example, here, uh, Regarding to aluminum alloys, we have here, for, ex for example, the temper situation of OH111. For example, for steel, we have uh, uh, the J0, J2, JR, something else. And these are always our uh, aging processes which we apply um, or which, which we apply on the material um, to get other beha material behavior, and this somehow can be seen on the Chopin impact test. But also, um, we can also apply uh, or get information as about the suspicion uh, to brittle fracture, and at the end, uh, get um, information about the respective temperatures for uh, the utilization, so for the usage of the material. So if the material is a material which would be uh, yeah, which, which is you good for the usage here in this point, or which may be not as good um, due to the environment we, we apply on our structure, or maybe also we see, okay, uh, for some specific uh, parts, we need a material which can handle higher yield strengths, which are maybe not allowed due to the codes, which are, uh, for example, have um, some other specifications. Um, so, in this case, um, it is more about uh, steels um, 
hyaloid steels and so on. And um, so at this time we can get our first information about is it uh, useful to use this kind of material or is it maybe not as useful and we should change uh, our assumption in this case. So um, where can you find uh, something like this? So this is truly a completely German uh, source, but uh, the FKM guideline um, 2009 is also, uh, you can get it in, in English, and so there you can find some information about uh, the evaluation of, of choppy tests, but also in the a ASTM um, there is um, a lot of information uh, due to the testing procedure in regarding to choppy tests and so on. So, uh, how does it look like if we go for old materials? So, for example, in case of old materials, uh, we talk about different uh, procedure, how to produce uh, the steel, and so this is something, some material which are, I would say, uh, older than 18, 19 years, uh, maybe 70 years, so where you have different con conditions, or different uh, crystalline conditions. And um, so at this side, as you can see here, um, this is, um, for example, material which we have now. And this is, for example, an older material, uh, which is yeah, from, from other production scheme. So as you can see here, um, for this kind of material, you have low impact stresses um, due to 100 degree of uh, temperature. So that's why for old materials, uh, the job impact test does not really respect our recommendations, our quality recommendations, and that's why we cannot apply, for example, um, yeah, um, codes or modifications which are applied to the job impact test. So, um, for example, um, due to um, some, yeah, some ideas. Um, the Chopi Intake Test gives you the information about um, some assessment um, due to the cracks in different situations. And due to this, um, this concept cannot be applied for the old, for the old materials. So, that's again. Um, so what are our main influencing parameters? So to suspect or to, to have some information about the brittle fracture, uh, as we had before, correct size, applied, stress, applied stress, but this side uh, we also talk about the fracture toughness, so KC, KC, so the energy, this the KC is at the end um, the stress intensity, and the stress intensity is a value which calculates uh, this point here. So really the, the stress at the notch tip. And um, for plastic information, uh, for plastic uh, deformations at the uh, notch tip, uh, we use the J. And um, for example, um, to have further information about plasticity, in the notch tip, um, you have the raw um, as a geometry information. So, if you talk about the fracture mechanics, um, we can talk about the material itself, so the material, what is it doing, but on the other hand, we have to somehow create our engineering model. So, the engineering model at this case has also some some fracture, uh, some crack included. At first we have some flaw and then some, some crack, the next step. So um, to give here, uh, yeah, and in this case we have to know about what is, uh, what is a, a crack on the one side, but also how can we define a crack. So, and therefore, uh, of course, uh, this is a nice statement because it's, of course it is true, every structure contains uh, small flaws and so the structure contains small cracks. Um, also, discontinuities exist in particle all 
structure members and ranging from below 0.0.2 centimeters to several centimeters long. So this is just, um, if you go back from yesterday, uh, a value where we say, okay, uh, there the crack initiation starts. So this is like the definition of the first crack we have in our structure. So which flaws? Um, so the, the basic information of a crack starting point do we have? Um, after the fabrication, um, this can be inclusions, enclaves, pores, cavities, lack of fusion, welding cracks, etc. So something um, we talked during the morning. And so also cracks are often under the surface. So we, if you go for visual inspection, we cannot see them, so they're there. Um, but for example, in an X-ray, we can see the 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 the, the small cracks, um, but also with some, some other tools, um, you can get already some information, how big is the porosity, or what is the, the income there. So, and what um, is the, the step from getting a flaw to a crack? Uh, of course, it's a dynamic loading, and of course, the stress corrosion cracking. So, um, this means, um, we have a, a stress which is applied to a crack and um, due to the stress the crack grows and that's why we say okay it is a stress corrosion crack because it is a, a time permanent process which is working on the crack. So and um, also this um, at the end is mainly acting on the surface. So um, so now we know about what, what can be in, in your ho still homogeneous uh, steel material and how do we get from a flaw to a crack or how do we define a crack. So in practice, a crack exists when it can be seen. So obviously I go to a structure, I have there's some rivet joint, I have there's some screws, I have there's some welded part. I go there, I see it. So I know, okay, there is a crack. So it is, we have some, some techniques which are quite easy and everybody has. So these are our eyes, some metallurgic microscope. So this is a microscope which is just pointing out at some, some small uh, scales. Um, but also if you go in laboratories, um, you have a microscope and so you can go there. But the microscope is nothing which you can go to a structure and say, okay, yeah, I put the, the bridge inside the microscope, doesn't work. So at the end, um, a free, the, the crack can vary between the two millimeters and down to one millimeters, but of course, uh, this down to is more respective to some specific uh, tools you have, like the microscope, like the um, glass, magnifier, glass magnifier. So. Um, so at the end, you have some micro cracks. Um, they are starting from the grain size. As we uh, as we talked yesterday, we have some deformation in the material. So due to the deformation in the material uh, and uh, some dislocations, the cracks started from the grain size due to the first broken grains, due to the first broken grain edges, and then this crack grows to one millimeter. And this is what we, what we talk about, the micro cracks. And afterwards, it goes to the macro cracks, which at the end can be seen by eye, by some specific tools. So, yeah. Um, how does it look like, um, for example, for a rivet joint? So we have here, for example, our two plates, uh, some gusset sheet plate between, and at the end, um, here our rivet joint. And of course, uh, the crack started from this point here, so from the edge um, where we have the, um, yeah, where the edge of the plate uh, goes to the rivet joint. And um, so this crack is over the whole sheet, and at the end it is growing from this part up to this part, and so, of course, at the end, you just can see the crack visibly 
if it is outside of the rivet joint, so at the end it has more than five millimeters of crack length. So um, how is the crack? No, this is slides later. So how does it look like, uh, for example, for other situations? So we have here, again, rivet structures um, or some screwed structures. Um, we have here our joint, and at the end, uh, we have the inner plate. And the, from this inner plate, as you can see here, the joint, uh, the crack is growing completely through. And at the end, uh, just the crack is visible after it reaches the outer, uh, the outer plane, a plate. So at this situation, uh, also here, um, we have yeah, some problems to see it. And um, so we always have to think, okay, how if you go for, for yeah, stuff like this, um, how is the, the structure of the beam designed? Is it, a, for example, a closing section, um, for example, for, from the fabrication? Or is it some older structure where um, the production of, of sections has not been as established? And so it is more a combined section uh, where at the end we have some rivet or screws uh, inside to combine each plate and at the end uh, the cracks are somewhere inside of our structure. So, um, this is um, yeah, just a, a recommendation uh, which is uh, here in the table of, an, of the Eurocode 1.3. So, um, of course, you have some method of inspection. This is the visual inspection and also the li liquid penetration test. Um, so this is um, something we had in, in the slides due to the failures uh, where at the uh, structure we, we saw the magenta uh, colored uh, lines and this is uh, the liquid penetrate testing. So it is just a coloring on, um, to make visible some, some cracks. Um, so the, the, the li liquid uh, goes into the crack and so at the end due to this you, it is visible because there you have a concentration of the color. So um, how can we define the crack? Um, this is always, for example, if you go for the continua, the, in the, inside the continua the crack is somewhere layered, it can be have some angle, it has some different sizes. So at the end, um, we have to define some cross section or some section, some area at which we at the end project our uh, crack. So at the end, um, that at the end we can get our uh, values to define a crack in our model, which will look like this. So for example, So for example, for our uh, steel plate, we have here crack inside. And for the crack, we have to know about these two distances. And this is always the 2A and the C. And uh, therefore, at the end, we have to, to define some tools to say, OK, if you go there, what is the size of our crack um, to have some, yeah, some some basic reglementations on how is the crack defined at the end on the structure itself. So um, as you can see here, um, this is the crack as it's growing. And at the end, um, we have here some load. The load is going in this direction. Um, so at this kind, you have um, the options to say, OK, is it just a, a the crack is just the projection rectangular to the stresses due to some limitations in the angle. Or um, to have to, to calculate with a, uh, a crack, which is at the end um, with some failure, uh, apply, um, which is without the failure of the projection. And so at the end, you also have to, to consider the angle 
in the modeling of the crack or on the stress assumption outside of this model. So, um, what are the main assumptions in our cracks um, or in the definition of the cracks? So we say, okay, usually you have a surface crack. So this is a crack which is just appearing uh, on the surface. So for example, it can be, if I go here, take my nail and make a scratch, this would be a surface crack. Um, the next one is an internal crack. So this is a crack which is inside uh, inside your plate, but it still is not going completely through. Uh, the other one, for example, would be this side, so just some failure, uh, the edge crack, and on the other side, the crack, which is complete, completely going through the structure, so it has at the end um, the, the crack intensity, um, so the crack tip is in this case is on this side, and this side, the crack tip is for this model, this line. Uh, for this model, you have the crack tip here and here. And also on this side, the crack tip is here. So, but what are the main parameters? So you have a crack depth of A and the crack length of C and the, the, uh, the depth of the position in the structure and also the notch radius and the material thickness. So, if now go uh, for our basic um, calculation models, so this is like how you gonna define or how you you give your information on how the crack look like, so how is the position on the crack, and what are the main geometric definitions. If you now go for the modeling itself or for the engineering models um, you have there, is you have to take um, yeah, the correct models. And so this is like at the end how it looks like. So you have a surface crack. Um, so just in visually uh, the small line with a 2C, uh, which at the end in the cross section has also here uh, this small crack inside with the legs of A. Then the through thickness crack, so the 2A, which is going completely through, and at this side, just a one sided crack. So we are on this side have also just one crack tip. Um, so that's why we have just here our A, and this is the edge crack. So, yeah, as we already see before, the cracks are defined by ellipses and they have semi-axis and projected to planes perpendicular to the main stresses. Uh, this is just an assumption which is, uh, yeah, which is done due to the angle of 20 degrees. So for example, if you have the main stress in another direction, um, then it also can occur due to some um, yeah, stress behavior or some stress reduction. Um, that maybe um, this st the, the stress is not acting in in the main stress direction. So this was yeah. so. Um, how is it established, um, or what are the first the first ideas or solutions which are done? Uh, the first ideas are. Uh, are done by Mr. Griffith, Griffith and uh, he uh, defined, therefore, uh, the through thickness crack. So this is also why this model is widely used uh, or widely known and um, also subjected to constant tensile stress. So, for example, if you think about uh, also some membrane forces which are acting on the stress, um, so due to this, you would have for a moment acting in this direction and the normal force, you would have at this side a smaller size of the, st of the stress intensity of the crack tip on this side than on this side. So that's why he choose here a quite um, easy assumption and said, okay, uh, take it easy. Uh, we just talk about a constant tensile stress and um, so also why now um, this is widely used 
is that in this case is the correct propagation. So the formula to define the correct rows um, can be easily, de or easily defined in a simple model. So again, uh, fracture mechanics. We have here our applied stress, the correct size, and our triangular with the fracture toughness. And um, so, as I told you before, um, in this case, we have to, to go more to an energetic approach. And for this, we have some energy balances to the structure with the scrap. So at the end, the whole energy is combined in a pos pot potential energy, uh, which is uh, defined by inter internal strain energy and the external force. So, and this is our total energy assumption. And therefore, we have three main parameters. So the V, this is the work caused by external loads. The U, the strain energy of the structure with no cracks. And the S, this is the work required to create new surfaces. So as we had yesterday, if we have here on this side our crack tip, uh, if the crack grows, we have to uh, get new surfaces. So um, to this, the atomic structure has to be broken up. And due to this, um, we need some energy which is required to have the crack growth. So how does it look like? Um, the total energy looks like at the same stage um, as a tension curve, um, but of course it is not. And um, so we have here our energy and the length of the crack. On the other hand, um, we have here our information of the structure without, uh, with for the new surface. And on this side, we have um, the working deformation uh, force and the energy which is in the structure without um, any crack. So at the end, um, this is the total energy. And so we have here um, a part which is, um, which is uh, absorbing the energy, but also some part which is getting the energy into the system. So um, this is as we, some f yeah, some slides we already had yesterday. So this is uh, the formation of the new crack surface. So at this side, uh, which is always important, is the surface energy um, of the material. And this is um, the information on how uh, or what energy um, do you need or is needed to get this curve and so to define new, surface, new surfaces at the crack tip. So at the end, um, you can, it is the main idea of Kruthev, which was um, established in 1921, that at the end he can define a fracture, a fracture stress, which is sigma f, is the square root of two times E times the surface energy over P over A. And um, of course, it, it looks like quite easy, but um, at the end, um, due to the material, um, yeah, the approach was a good idea, but it was not as good. So um, with the Griffith uh, equation, um, f this is mainly known for, or many, mainly applied to brittle materials. Um, he could also define some YS for aluminum of 1.2, 2.0, and 2.4 for steel. But um, as you see here, um, the equation itself it is already uh, saying that it is just uh, practical for brittle materials. And if you talk about aluminum, kupfer, but also steel, uh, this is not really a brittle material in the normal case of usage. So, and therefore, um, this is the main assumptions we have 
until uh, or what were the, the main assumptions when uh, the calculation of fracture mechanics started. So we had here the model of Griffiths. And, um, but the next one is that um, to describe the field distribution near to a crack. So near to a crack means we have here on the side our crack tip. And um, the same as in, for example, in shell structures, um, we want to apply here a field distribution to define at the end some information about the flow of the stresses of the strains next to our crack tip and so get at the end some information about the stresses which are applied on the crack tip and so at the end get information on um, the resistance or also the, the loading on our crack tip. So uh, therefore um, we just say okay nominal stresses are applied in the structure the size and the shape and the orientation of the crack has to be known and also some material properties. So therefore, um, Irwin, William and Sneeden defined it for this situation and also for this coordinate system. Um, this definition of the sigma x, sigma y and the tau. Um, for example, if you go for a numerical simulation, um, you also always have to apply on the correct tip your coordinate system. So otherwise you cannot evaluate um, the stress intensity on the correct tip, but also um, you cannot um, define, for example, um, the information due to um, the J uh, integral, which is more for deformed, so for plastic deformations next to the correct tip. And so this is like really historical uh, approach which is still if you go for numerical investigations there. So of course um, if we talk about the stresses um, we have to think about the size of our sheet. So for example if you think about a plane stress uh, a crack through the, the plate and you have a plate which has a dimension of 20 millimeters um, you cannot talk about a plane strain or a plane st uh, about a plane stress situation. Um, but for example, if you go for a, a, plane, a plate which has just a dimension of one millimeter or uh, even uh, less, um, then you get into information where you can really go and say, okay, this is a plane stress um, model for the crack itself. So. Um, at the end, what was the intent uh, to describe the stress intensity factor is to describe the magnitude of the stress increase in the elastic stress field when approaching the crack tip. Important here is that here at the crack tip it is really a sharp edge so that you don't, you don't have any radius there, so the radius at this point is going to zero, um, as it is also shown here. So for example, at the end, you can define at, for the crack tip the stress intensity factor, okay? And the stress intensity factor, as we announced before, is always defined due to the normal stress, um, due to the floor size, some function due to the geometry, and some function due to the specimen. So this is more about, um, yeah, some some changes in, in, the, in the stress field next to the crack, applied crack model. So how does it look like? Um, if you, for example, go for numerical investigations, uh, you see here um, the crack tip. And also, if you think about your coordinate system, so your coordinate system, the x direction, the y direction into the crack is defined. The x direction is in this one, and the y direction is in this one. So you see the stress field next to the crack uh, is completely uh, in normal usage um, of them. Uh, on an American investigation, you would say you have here a singularity. 
but due to the, the modeling or the usage of the element, at the end you can also describe some information due to the uh, stress, due to the stress intensity factor on the crack tip itself. So, if you now go um, for the, the stresses which we already see here and which are acting on our stress tip, we have to think about different modes. And these modes are always known as the K1, K2, K3. The K1 mode is just a mode which is opening the crack. So it's like a mouth and this mouth is going up. Then the K2 is sliding of the crack tip, so it is uh, going in both directions. So the crack tip is here and it is more like shear on our crack tip. And um, the K3 is more a torsion on our crack tip. And these are the three basic modes um, you have here for the definition of the stress intensity factor. And if you, if you go, for example, to a more basic uh, definition of the crack uh, model, you end up, for example, for this one, uh, at quite nice formulas, uh, where at the end um, you can f um, also go and calibrate some numerical models, but also go and uh, calculate your stresses and also at the end uh, get the information of the K1, K2, K3 and uh, yeah, go and um, I would say um, also for, um, for the testing itself um, you can uh, calibrate your testing models to find the resolutions um, about the opening of the crack tip um, but also about um, the K1, K2, K3. So, yeah, uh, as uh, Mrs. Radlbeck here mentioned, uh, in the lecture we usually say, okay, uh, just the K1 is important um, because still um, we had yesterday, we had a, a crack which was going in each direction due to, to, to the transcrystalline opening of the crack, or uh, of the, uh, of the the, the micro crack, um, but for example, at the end, um, it always goes to a mode to the mode one, uh, or it usually goes to the mode one, uh, just to the crack propagation. So, um, for example, if you have some differences, before we we talked about the situation of the brittle fracture. So this is regarding to the fractured toughness. Um, there, I would assume to take K1, K2, K3 into account if you go for the crack propagation. So about really the, the most, um, the most, or the, the, the most stress, uh, stress intensity direction, uh, at the end um, it always ends up in the mode one. So um, how is it our stress intensity factor at the end defined? So this is something you also can find in the FKM, or for example, um, there is also a quite huge compendium, uh, which is done by, uh, yeah. Murakami, or uh, which are mostly opened, uh, you can find some old papers uh, from the NASA and there they also investigated some, yeah, some, some crack models and at the end um, you, you have to go through what are the main assumptions there, what are the basic informations you get there and um, at the end you can choose here a quite simple analytical model um, or you have to go for, yeah, further investigations in your crack assumptions. So, and as we had before, the through thickness crack model, as you can see here, is just the K1 sigma times the square root of P and A. And um, so this model is quite easy. And uh, that's why also this model is open, uh, often applied for calculations. So, what is the fracture toughness? 
the fracture toughness um, at the end is a principle um, to give information about the unstable fracture occurrence. Um, so when the stress intensity factor at the correct tip reaches the value Kc. So we have now the information of and k. This is uh, regarding to a and our value sigma. And this value on the other side has a kc. So, and this is depending on the material. So, and with this uh, two informations at the end, we can describe um, our crack model and also describe or give some informations about uh, what gonna happen next to the crack tip. Is it gonna grow? Is it uh, gonna break through or something else? So, and also at the end, the applied stresses. So, and, um, This one, yeah, and the K1C, so this is also, um, the KC is usually the fracture toughness. The K1C is likely combined to the K1 mode, so the correct tension um, for the plane strain condition. So, but also due to this, um, as it is a lot of testing and a lot of uh, ex yeah, experience, in, in the laboratory, uh, it is demanding and co uh, time and really cost intensive to investigate uh, these parameters um, for the materials. Um, but also, it is um, on the other side, it is um, yeah changing due to the production. So, for example, that's why you, at, this, at the other side you have to find some some informations. Uh, what are good assumptions and what is a real parameter at the end you can calculate with. So, yeah. So, how does it look like um, for the relation between the material toughness, the correct size, and also the stress we apply? So, before we had the triangular of the fracture toughness, the correct size A, and also of the stresses uh, we apply there, or which are gonna be applied there. So, um, these uh, are our parameters um, for, uh, for the resistance. So, the COD, the one in C and the R, and in this case, related to the J1C, it's the K1C in the, in, in the elastic condition. So the J1C is giving you information in elastic and plastic behavior. The K1 is just defined for the elastic. So in elastic condition, you can calculate from the J1C also the KC. So, and due to this, by, for example, for the stress value, you have, a, if you reach the KC by this crack size, and um, so this is the information also when your crack will fail. But for example, if you increase your stress, of course, the crack size is also reduced. Um, on the other hand, if you have small cracks, um, you also can handle larger crack sizes. So um, therefore, it is like uh, always to, to get a, I would say, a, a really good assumption or a idea what is happening there is, um, if for example, if you go for buckling behavior, buckling behavior is something which is well known usually. And in the buckling behavior of a column, you have usually the, the Euler curve. This is our resistance curve in our system. And at the end, you have a top level, which is depending on the yielding, on the, on the behavior uh, of the, yeah, of the, uh, of the not really slender curve uh, beam. And um, so this is at the same time um, con uh, comparable or similar to this, so that at the, for an um, for, um, elastic material, which, is n which has no really influence by yielding, you have good assumptions for the KC with the 
in this case, also the same shape of the curve. Um, but if, for example, if you go for yielding, you also reach some top level. So why is um, it important uh, if you talk about cracks and the crack, uh, cracks and uh, fractured toughness? We talk about the material thickness is um, that due to the thickness of, um, for example, of the steel plate, um, also the, the, the material behavior, the behavior in the continuum changes. Um, so, for example, as we have before for a thin blade, we can talk about a plane stress behavior. Um, so, on the due to the due to the or due to the small size, uh, we have the in our plate or plane the sigma set set is always zero. If we go for a thick plate, um, we have in the inner side. Uh, plane strain behavior, so due to the material on both sides, we have no deformation in, each in, in the set directions, but also we have um, stress in the set directions. And due to this, um, we have here a material effect, which also acts on our K1C. So for example, for thicker materials, our K1C is reduced, and um, for the plane strain, um, it is going upwards, and then also we have some lowering there. So, how does it look like? So, for example, for small, um, for small thicknesses, we have here the high amount of K1C, and if we now go for thicker elements, um, we have here a factor of 2.5, which is uh, which is there included. Um, just due to the change of the stresses inside our inside the plane, which are at the end also acting on our on the stresses inside the material inside of the surface floor or surface cracks. So, how does it look like? Um, some material values K1C, uh, which you somehow can find in literature. Um, they are. I would say not um, not always comparable to the real behavior, but usually um, they should be they are, should be reached due to the quality management in the uh, companies which are producing these materials. So, as you can see here, um, some other examples due to some other materials. So, for example, for polymers or for example concrete. Um, you're for the fracture toughness, um, you're quite low. It is really small. If you go, for example, for steel, um, you get increasement, and also that's why we have, um, for example, usually no problems with cracks, um, but um, we have some problems due to the specific situations with the cracks, but usually not due to just the loading and uh, the crack appearances due to some small stresses, uh, tension stresses inside the material. So, um, how does it look like as we had before? So, just a small diagram. Uh, we know about our K1C, we know about our A, so we, have, we can, at the end, we can calculate our stresses which can be applied. So, for example, if you say, okay, you have some structure there um, and you know about the K1C, you know about the, the cracks which are already there, um, you can recalculate your structures, um, the, the loading of your structure, and so at the end you can say, okay, what is the loading which can be applied on the structure, and you have to find some solutions to, at the end, not to have higher loads in your bearing system or at the joints of interest. So the next step is um, you have a K1C, you cannot re reduce uh, your stresses, so at the other side um, you can calculate um, the maximum length of your crack which should be in the system and which, should be, which could be applied uh, on due to in, uh, inspections and so on. So 
how does it look like um, at the end? Um, if we have, for example, the situation that um, we had before. So, so we have here our starting crack with the A0, A0, and at the end we want to go um, to a crack length which is A critish. So this is the situation of failure. And um, due to the definitions of the linear elastic behavior, um, there was some first definitions which were done by Mr. Paris um, about the crack propagation. And the prop crack propagation usually is uh, defined or divided into three sections. So you have section one, section two, and section three. The section one is the section uh, where you usually have no, um, no stresses which are resulting in the correct propagation. So if your value is beyond this value, um, if, your, if your KT or K1, delta K1 is beyond the delta KT, so um, your crack will not grow again or will not grow. Uh, in the section two, you have a, a behavior which is quite linear, but also just in a double logarithmic scale. So, as you can see, uh, if you would take this curve and you would uh, draw this curve in a normal space, uh, it would be not, uh, not really um, linearly. So, this is really something which is also uh, just in, in the fatigue di diagrams and in the fracture diagrams, the double local scale at the end gives you the linear, linear curves. So, and at the end, we have the section, section three, and here we have the delta K max and also the K by C. So, this is uh, at the end the situation of the section three where we have an unstable crack growth, and at the end the situation where yeah, the crack occurred where the, fa uh, where the, where the failure ends up. So, um, usually if you go and go for inspection and you say, okay, you have here an A0 and um, you start your calculations, you want to be into the section two because there you have a um, stable crack propagation and um, you can define at the end um, yeah, your, your crack model um, due to some materials parameters which are defined in the correct propagation model of Paris. So here, dA over, uh, over dN. So an incremental crack uh, grows over uh, the numbers of cycles in during the crack growth, then the C and the delta Km. So this is uh, the applied stress during the mean value of the applied stress during this crack growth. So, at the end, um, also again, we have here some crack, in, crack initiation. So this is the delta KTH. Um, so this is the start of the, uh, of the macro crack. So here, a little bit different um, a definition of the crack initiation. So because in, in the micro crack, we started with the crack initiation due to the deformation of the dislocations in the structure. Here we define the crack initiation from the micro crack to the macro crack. So this is uh, the step where we say, okay, from the fatigue design to the fracture uh, mechanics. And at the end, we have a stable two, a section two with the stable crack propagation and a section three with the instable crack propagation. So in here at the section three, we also have the KC, which is at the end, um, yeah, um, gives you our value for the A-critish. So, um, how does it look like? Um, we have here the crack propagation law um, with some function dA over dN, dF. So, this is uh, the, the, the law from Paris. We have delta K over R and H, and delta K is the stress intensity factor 
the R is the stress ratio, and the H is at the end the term for load history. So for example, also there, um, there are some models to apply some, some other loads than assigners. Um, but uh, this is also um, here often chosen to H0 um, due to just applying and signers. So then the Paris law for section two um, gives us this information. And um, so by going to testing at the end, we get somehow these curves. So we have here also again for different R values, a shift of our curves. So the R value is also here. It is um, influencing our resistance curve. And, um, but at the end, the K max, so this value um, somehow is less uh, influenced. Um, so this can be somehow comparable to um, our fatigue curves. So how does it look like, or what are the advantages um, for our crack broker propagation? Um, we have only two parameters. So we have an analytical solution, which you can provide in, in this situation. Um, disadvantage, of course, we have no threshold value, which gives us the change from fatigue to fracture. And in some cases, it's not as important, because in the, for example, for a preliminary design, we can take our fatigue curves, uh, which already include our f the, in the information of the fracture. But uh, if we go for inspection, so for um, uh, some advantages to maintain our structure, we can calculate with our already, um, yeah, with the cracks which are already there. And, uh, but we don't know about this value at the end. So, um, and also, um, we just describe in this section with the Paris 2 law, so of the A over the N, and C delta KM. So if we, for example, go from Paris to a more modified system, this would be the NASCAR. But the NASCAR, as you can see here, the formula is quite, uh, yeah, it's not as nice. And, um, but it also takes into account this value and this value. Uh, but at this situation, you have to do more testing, get more material parameters, and also get more information about the real behavior uh, inside your structure. And so this is something which is um, of interest. But um, to start with um, something like uh, correct calculations, correct propagations, first estimations, um, the Paris law always gives you the, the first ideas, I would say. So, and for example, to this, um, I prepared a small uh, Excel sheet just to give you some feedback on how it uh, looks like. So, if we take here um, our crack modeling. Um, so, for example, we have here um, our small model um, with, the grit, with the grittest crack. So, we have here our crack, our constant stress value, and also defined on this side a crack with A0. Uh, with A0 and a sigma max and a sigma min of 150 MPA and a sigma min of zero MPA. So we have an R value of zero. And um, we have some material parameters that are chosen from literature. And the K1C uh, in this case is estimated due to the table before. Um, as in the literature, there was no information given. So just for, uh, for teaching example, I did it like this. So the material in the resistance curve at the end looks like this. So we have here our Paris law for section two. So in this case, we have here um, our section two, the KT1, we don't know. The KC1 was estimated. And so by recall, um, by estimate or by using our formula for the K1 for the correct through 
uh, crack. We can reorganize our uh, system of equation and at the end can recalculate our, the A critish by, of course, doing at this stage just a linear extrapolation of our Paris law and at the end have here, of course, some, some, some failure um, due to um, not really or bad estimated crack growth for this part. Um, due to this formula at the end we can calculate here the 6.366 millimeters and um, also by applying the, the Paris equation for the crack, crack, crack propagation at the end, okay this formula should look like a little bit different. Um, so this formula This should be the formula, and uh, by just applying this formula from the integral from A0 to some different steps, A1, um, we get here the amount of cycles which result at the end um, due to the correct length and due to the A British. So we're uh, at the end where the situation fails. So for this situation, for example, with 150 MPa, we could handle around 3, point, um, 3 times 10 over 6. If we now, um, for example, increase to 180 from 150, of course, um, at the end, we are lowering the amount um, of cycles we can handle due to our definition from 3.10 over 6 to 1.6 over 10 over 6. That's 3.6 times 10 over 6. Okay, sorry. So this is um, something, as you can see, um, some basic calculations for, for the correct rows and also to estimate um, the critical correct length by, of course, uh, doing in this part a quite bad assumption, but um, not knowing more information at the first level um, of investigation, um, you have to go this step. Okay, um, so this was uh, oh was quite long. Sorry uh, for the overtime. Um, so this was I think the first two days um, of the program. Um, next week um, we are gonna continue on some models due to the KC and um, also the evaluation of fatigue tests. And on the second day, uh, I'm gonna finish with some, yeah, some different assumptions due to the definitions of load cycles uh, and also on the counting methods, how you can at the end um, define some load collectives due to your measuring. And so at the end, hopefully you have a, yeah, simply set of uh, tools uh, which you hopefully can apply in the future. Okay, so thanks a lot for listening today and see you next week on Monday.